Hello everyone, today is Thursday, October 1st, 2015, and this is the week in charts. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about? Well, I want to talk about surviving and possibly even prospering during the upcoming bear market. Now, I guess the question is, how do I know it's a bear market? So I'm going to show you. And to short or not to short, that's a bit of a rehash from uh, a presentation I've done quite a few times before. And uh, looking back, it looks like I did it uh, just a couple of months ago. So it looks like it was a very timely press, um, presentation back then, if I say so myself. All right, let's talk about surviving and prospering during the upcoming bear market. I guess the question is, how do I know? And if you go in and watch my recent YouTubes, I pointed out some signals. And what's kind of surprising is I went back about a month or so, or even even longer, and I was showing some uh, signals way back then. So that was kind of a cool thing to see. It doesn't always unfold like this, but it's pretty cool when it does. So how do I know? Well, first and foremost, I don't, okay? A market could do whatever it wants to do. It doesn't care about you. It doesn't care about me. And it certainly doesn't care about the guy who screams on TV. So a market could do, again, whatever it wants. I would prefer... If it just went up, that's a lot easier to trade a bull market. You just kind of sit back, relax, count your money, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. But the signs are there, though, that we could be entering into a bull market. Now let's get this silly death cross out of the way. Media gets all excited about it. And I've been having quite a, quite a bit of fun with it, too. But I went back and did a little research. Uh, Ron Grice did a lot of research, too, and I kind of dovetailed in on some of his stuff. and. The thing that I was looking at mostly was not necessarily what happens if you if you buy and sell during these crossovers. And Rob Hanna, who's a friend of mine, and I'm going to mention Vegas in a little while, but uh, Rob's going to be in Vegas with us. And he's also uh, speaking at the expo. But if you do this mechanical testing, it's not going to test out longer term. And moving average crosses in general are going to test out longer term because – with moving average crosses, a lot of times you'll get whipsaw when the market is choppy. And then when the market begins to trend, some really nice things can happen. It's this part that makes a moving average crossing dangerous. And I would imagine if you had a shorter term moving average in here, you probably would have seen a lot of buys and sells in here, which you would have lost a heck of a lot of money with. However, as I often say, everything works better with trend. It's the blue bonnet of market so right now you're getting we uh, recently had this death cross and we're seeing some of these other signals so it, it's kind of a warning that hey something bad might be happening here and we need to pay attention and obviously we'll get the price in just one second just on a price basis too now what i did again getting back to the taking ron greaser ron grice's research that's that's hard to say uh <laughs> And, and running with it, one thing I looked at is like, okay, what happens after the death cross and before it crosses back up? Like, what's the worst that happens before these two moving averages cross back up? And to my amazement, in many cases, the market has had, has had some – one cup of coffee tomorrow, Dave. So fairly – it's a good thing I'm not in a do today too, right? The market has had some very significant drops – after the crossing so you have to be careful and not necessarily trade these on a mechanical basis but you also have to be careful and, and pay attention to the signal as a general statement and Robin would say uh rob was saying this too i gotta get on ron and rob getting confused today but rob was saying this too if you generally trade it on the short side with the moving averages across down when you have a so-called death cross and if you generally trade on the long side when the moving averages were uh, or above, the so-called golden cross, you would probably do okay. And I think Rob went on to say, and I fully agree with him, you probably would beat most people who just obviously follow the market all the way down. So it, I think it pays to pay attention. But the scary part is sometimes after these signals, the market can lose as much as 80% of its value. And it's kind of like, don't believe me, we'll go back and look at – the recent week in charts that I've done where I've talked about 
just that. And then obviously in 2000 and 2008, the market lost a significant amount of its of its value. Uh, in fact, we also have a weekly bow tie work. Now, the weekly bow tie, and I've talked about this quite a bit, but for those of you, I always forget this. A lot of new people coming along, and that's great. Glad to have you. The bow tie signal or any emerging trend, sometimes I call them trend transitional signals, but any emerging trend, and that's just a fancy way of saying a new trend, a new trend that's developing. An old one's coming to an end, and a new one is beginning to develop. I get more questions on my emerging trend patterns than all of my other patterns combined. It is a little bit more difficult to learn to recognize emerging trends, but it's something that you're going to have to learn how to do it. It's really not that hard. And the, the bow tie moving averages, the beauty of them is, even though there's a little lag to them, if a trend does develop, and I guess if is a key word in that sentence, it, it can help to keep you on the right side of the market, just like the death cross or anything else like that. But a major signal is, comes off of major highs. Now, this is an all-time high. The last two major sells we've had have come off of all-time highs, obviously in 2000 and in 2008. And it was actually in early 2008 when we had the crossover on a weekly basis. Now, by the way, I don't want to digress too far, but I got some emails or one email, email in particular Ask me about some weekly setups and some stocks that have rolled over. And the, to answer the question, yes, patterns are fractal. And yes, those stocks are set up. Or in the case, I think it was Yahoo, it could set up soon. However, I don't think you should rush out and try to trade on the weekly side. Because, especially on the short side, because they slide faster than they glide. By the time you finally get that weekly set up, the whole bear move could actually be over. But Dave, why are you showing us the weekly bow tie? Well, because I think you have to pay attention to what's going on in the overall market and look at the daily signal, look at the weekly signal, and look at the monthly signals to just get a, a good big picture view of what's happening. Now, some people drill down a little further. There's nothing wrong with that. The only problem is you got to be careful with the noise. But look at hourly charts. And I haven't uh, looked at them recently, but I guarantee you, that we, I guarantee, I could almost, I would almost bet my life that we had a nice hourly bow tie coming off of all time highs, probably on, um, probably on this day I'm pointing to here or somewhere in here, we probably had an hourly bow tie. The problem with that is you're going to have more and more signals the shorter the time frame. So why am I looking at the weekly? Well, because it's relevant and because obviously we turn a long time ago in the daily chart, but once you get these bigger picture turns, then it becomes more and more important to pay attention to what happens next. And again, we lost about half of the market's value over the last the last two times that this happened. Doesn't mean that it's always going to work this great, okay? But over the last 20 or so years, these signals have worked out really good. Maybe they're due not to work anymore. I hope, I hope, I hope this signal fails miserably. And I hope the market goes straight up. And people have been telling me lately, it's, it's funny. It's like the people who get the methodology, the people who understand trend following, they're like telling me, stop apologizing, Dave. Markets go up and markets go down. Well, the reason I apologize is because if I don't, I'm going to get all this hate mail because I'm a bear and they're still long and blah, blah, blah. It's like human nature never changes. And sometimes I write a column and I'll say, markets go up, markets go down. I know, duh. But you'd be surprised how many people fight it, how many people – They'll take that. You know, you could tell anyone in the world that. They're like, yep, yeah, that's true. That's true. It's like, well, why are you still long when it's going down? Well, it'll come back. It's like, well, well sometimes it doesn't. So it does pay to pay attention when you have these weekly bow tie signals. As I've said quite a bit, you're probably sick of me saying this. I've had a lot of people tell me, uh, people who are fans of the show, it's like, okay, Dave, enough with the weekly signals. We see them. You know, you, would, you kind of beat the dead horse on that quite a bit. But I'm going to keep beating the dead horse until everyone gets it. Now, and if you go back a couple of shows, I talked about signs, signals, setups, and triggers. Okay, So signs, and we'll flesh this out in a little more uh, detail in just one second. But a sign is that, okay, well, this thing is going mostly sideways on a weekly chart. So you know it's lost some momentum. And then the signal would be obviously the bow tie, or the setup would be the bow tie. Okay. 
The signal would be the crossing of the bow tie. The setup would be mean when the bow tie actually sets up by the market pulling back. And the trigger is what it takes out its previous low. I don't, I'm kind of rushing through this, but we've talked about this quite a bit uh, in prior webinars. So go in and watch the YouTubes on that. Everything is now public on those. I used to sell the webinars, but now I just um, I felt like it was nickel and diamond. So I just put them out there for free. Anywho, well, we had a trigger on a one-week basis, and now we've taken out multi-week lows in the market. So this is somewhat concerning in here. Now, this could just be the mother of all corrections, and maybe I'm fear-mongering, but it just doesn't look that good just yet. Okay, just the charts, ma'am. Well, any indicator, including a moving average, is going to have lag. And you'll find with me, I rarely dust off the moving averages unless the market is beginning to roll over. And I think they kind of give you an idea of, of what the market is doing, not what the market will do, but what the market is doing. But Dave, you just said the market drops 50% and sometimes 80%. It's like, yeah, that's because a trend begins to develop. The moving average doesn't indicate that will happen, but it illustrates what happened or what has happened in the charts. I've met some very smart people. I've, I've been blessed in this uh, career. And, and I mean, I'm not bragging because I've been, I mean, I've been around, I was around so long. There was only like a few of us out there <laughs> many, many years ago. We all knew each other, but um, I've been lucky enough to meet quite a few people. And some people use a lot of indicators. It's like, okay, you got to buy here. And it's like, well, I don't like the chart. It's like, I'd be willing to bet what well, most successful people, or maybe even all, I would say, who are successful with indicators, I bet if you took away the indicators of bar, they could still read a chart. So an indicator, at least the way I see it, is just an illustrator. It helps to illustrate what's actually happening in the chart. So always look at price first and foremost, and that's what we're going to do right now. Now, the trend is your friend until it bends, right, in the end. So we've had this great, great run going all the way back to 2009, and I'm going to beat the dead horse a little bit on that just one second. And now you can see that we've kind of had this rollover in here, especially in more recent times, okay? And one thing that I talked about on YouTube I did a couple days, well, I actually did yesterday, okay, is that if you look at where the market is, now, and you go back to, let's just say, sometimes around last October, well, guess what? The market is lower than it was a year ago. So remember, with technical analysis, everything I do has some sort of psychological basis to it, okay? Um, fortunately, uh, early in my career, I... I I was able to hook up with some very smart people and I was actually doing some programming and research and I would take their systems and make them better. And I, at the same time, I was writing my own systems, mechanical systems. And every now and then I'd stumble across something that worked, but made no sense. And when I showed at least one individual in particular, he was like, well, yeah, it's weird, but it needs to be conceptually correct. You need to explain to me why it's working and not just some sort of random aberration. And then maybe we could do something with this. So I take the same approach to technical analysis. I put some sort of psychological basis onto it. And all I'm doing is reading the mind of the market. So what I'm saying here with how's my portfolio is – if you've been buying stocks since 2009, I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself, but and then you look at your portfolio over the last year, you're like, wait a minute, this uh, perpetual money machine might be coming to an end. I lost money over the last year, okay? And anyone who bought prior to the last year is still in the money, but they're beginning to see some of that money evaporate. So at the least, it's beginning to make them think about – their portfolio okay now let's talk about those who may have bought in more recent times okay so the question is should I scratch out and that's just simple 
Technical Analysis 101. Go back and read books. As I said in last week's seminar, or when I forget when, but um, webinar, I wrote um, that you should you know, read the new, read the modern classics, of course, when it comes to technical analysis and charts and patterns and setups and all these things. But also, as a general statement, try to read books that are at least 50, 60, and maybe even more years old, and you'll see that there's nothing new under the sun because human nature never changes. And I'm going to flesh that out in just a second, too. Um, but you can see that anyone who bought during this range, since the market has dropped below it, will likely be looking to get out when it rallies back up to it. Now, somebody said, hey, Dave, how do you know they didn't all sell? I don't, okay? We don't know for sure, okay? If we knew for sure, then we'd be sitting on our boats right now and relaxing, okay? We wouldn't have to work so hard to figure out the charts. But I don't think they all sold because this whole thing unfolded in about three days. And then, of course, the market has a sharp retrace rally, which makes everyone think, oh, everything's fine. And then now we've begun to sell off again, and we might bounce around a little bit in here. But don't get too caught up and the uh, retrace, okay? So I don't think everyone sold, and as Phil, who's a friend of the show and a client, pointed out a few weeks back, Apple has over 5,000 funds that own it. So you really think all 5,000 funds got out of Apple already? And Apple's part of the Dow, and it's also part of, uh, it's a big part. It used to be what twenty percent of the Nasdaq 100, and then they uh, they they pull it back, and then it's grown again, and then they pull it back. So I doubt seriously that those people have sold. Now, human nature never changes. Catching the falling knife. We'll talk about this, or I've talked about this quite a bit, and I'll talk about it a little bit in a few minutes. I think a lot of people will try to catch that falling knife, and then they felt like a genius for a little while, and now I think they're too. Uh, Fitting for October, I think they're beginning to think, boo. <laughs> and a friend in college, he would boo things when things didn't go well. He's like, boo. Kind of reminds me of him. Um, so I think the market is still in trouble just looking at the flat out charts, but we also have side signal setups and, of course, triggers. Okay. Now, as I kind of alluded to a second ago, Paul, we'll get to that in just one second. I'd be happy to do that. Talk about that. Uh, have we become too comfortable with the bull? And, and I did I've got a little video of this gentleman here playing with his bull. Um, I haven't watched Craig Ferguson again, but the little robot on there used to go, is that code? Is, which I thought was pretty funny. I, I, one of you will get that, so that will be funny. Um, and I think quite possibly the answer to that question is yes. And as I talked about in video, my last or time before last market, video market update, is it's possible that people have this permanent income hypothesis. And that's a big phrase I learned back when I was working on my MBA, as I said in the video, back when the earth was cooling a long, long time ago. And since 2009, obviously, we had a pretty good run. There's been some corrections in between. But the market has taught people that, hey, don't. Give up your positions. I, you know, and, and I don't know where he is now or what happened to him, but someone was was doing really well following someone's system. And I'm not going to say I hate to say any names because, you know, we all have our turn in the barrel in this game. But I remember they were following this popular system and they were absolutely printing money. And I was kind of enthralled by the fact that they were printing money. And I was pretty impressed. And then the market began to crash, and I saw some of their positions get absolutely decimated. So I asked them, I said, so what, what do you do? I said, what do you do when this happens? He's like, oh, you, well, David, you can't lose your position. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? I mean, you just, you just lost 50 points at this one stock, and you're still holding on. So, um, you know, maybe that's part of the methodology. I don't know. But I think that people have been trained, again, a new crop comes along every few years, and that's why technical analysis will probably always work. That's one thing I'm not worried about. Like I wrote a column a few <laughs> a few weeks ago or a week ago, uh, you know, I'm worried about running out of beer, worried about running out of meat or coffee, but I'm not really worried about technical analysis uh, no longer working. 
So anyway, I think a lot of people have this permanent uh, market hypothesis or permanent income hypothesis, however you want to think about it. And as some people pointed out, now this is a weekly chart. It looks a little bit better on a monthly. Um, there are some people that are still long-term bulls, and I can't completely argue with that. I mean, we've had some pretty serious corrections in here. The market has come back, okay? Is this one going to be the real deal? I don't know. But as my friend Greg Morris says, and he's uh, he's uh, semi-retired now, but he used to run billions, uh, literally billions of dollars. And as he said, he's, we treat all signals as if it's going to be the big one. And I think you have to do that when it comes to the markets. And this is why I'm not fear-mongering, but I'm just saying, hey, what is, is. So we need to pay attention. And again, I'm not apologizing. I'm just telling you what I'm hoping. I'm hoping nothing, none of this pads out and everything goes right back up. But if it does begin to pan out, I'll be ready. And if it goes right back up, I can deal with that too. I'm a trend follower. Some people call me a trend following moron. I don't care. Just don't call me late for supper. <laughs> you can call me whatever you want. All right, where's Rusty? Well, Russell 2000. And I just use the IWM as a proxy, just FYI, the ETF. Not looking too good. And if you go back and watch shows going all the way back to, I guess, June or July, I was pointing out uh, multiple day bow ties in the Russell 2000 off of all time highs. So, so far, it's not a good thing. And this is more indicative of what's really happening in the overall market. Uh, the question is, somebody's been waiting patiently, so let me just answer this really quick. Uh, bar charts seem bar charts seem unclear. Candles are better. Not your idea. Um, well, Paul, um, I started using candles, and one reason I like candles was was yes, you're right. You could see the bars more clearly, and unfortunately, you can't do it with a telechart. But in Metastock, when I do look at the bar charts in Metastock, I make them a lot thicker, especially if I'm going to put them in an article or something. Whereas um, it's kind of a bummer. I don't know why a telechart doesn't allow that. And that's something that I would like to see in telechart. But, you know, the thing about telechart is it's quick and dirty, and it does what I need. And it does what I need to do fast, whereas these other programs, much more advanced, much more fancy, you know, so fancy. But every now and then there's a few things that are lacking that I wish that I kind of uh, yearn for in uh, TC. Now, to answer your question is I did start using candles for a while. And I read all the books and uh, got the T-shirts. And my problem is, and I've said this a thousand times for you people who have been in before, so my apologies for answering this question, um, or being redundant, I should say. My problem is that the candle people tend to make a pattern out of everything. And right about the time I really got sucked into the candle thing, um, I was fortunate enough to hook up with a lot of old school traders who were still in the bar charts, and you weren't gonna, you'd have to pull those bar charts away from them. And um, so I went back to the bar charts, and I have I can read a bar chart better than I can read a candle chart because I'm looking for the Western patterns more than I'm looking for the, the fat man holding the baby with the poopy diaper or whatever other patterns there are. So that's why I use them. Now, in some other trading that I do, uh, by default, the candles have come up, and I use the candles, but I'm not. Uh, that's mainly in Forex, and I'm, but I'm not really focused so much on the – on the bars themselves. It's just the default chart that comes up and I'll leave them that, uh, that way. So I, I will use a candle chart. I hear what you're saying. I will occasionally use a candle chart. Like if it defaults to a candle, which it does in this program, that the other program that I have, I just leave it most of the time and don't bother changing it back. But when I'm looking at stocks and doing all the stock picking, I like to look at a bar chart so I could see the, the, the Western patterns developing. And it's just a matter of personal preference. I hear you, though. It would show up better if I'm using a candle chart on here, but uh, that's a long-winded answer. As a friend of mine says, long story endless, too late. All right, so the question is, I've made a case for a possible bear market. So the question is, well, what do you do? Well, these are the six things that I think you should do. And rather than read them all to you now, let's just break it down. You want to honor your stops on any left over longs. And I just randomly picked a stock that I remember from recently. And this is one we got long last September, rallied up. We took some partial profits, okay? And then it looked like after a long consolidation, it looked like it was off to the races. And I was feeling pretty good, feeling, feeling pretty smart back here. We had a nice wide stop in place. We're ready to ride out longer-term trend. Well, what happened? 
came right back in, stopped us up. Okay. But Dave, you gave up a lot of that trend. Well, so what? Okay. If you want to catch a long term trend, you're going to have to let that trend go against you a little bit because that adverse move might just be a correction. Now, to anyone who complained about this trade, I told them this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to fix this. Send me all the money you made. Dave Landry. Okay. Centive Trading LLC. CO Dave Landry. P.O. Box 298 Abita Springs, Louisiana 70420. Send me all the money you made on the trade. Okay. And I will gladly take that from you. And then just, just, just sit back and relax. Maybe meditate a little bit. And just forget about the trade, okay? Just just forget about it. So you can wash it clean from your system, and you don't have to worry about all that troublesome cash, okay? It's kind of like nice and relaxing, isn't it? So never be mad when you made money. I remember early on, I got a really shitty feel on something. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't abysmal, but I obviously got effed, okay? And it was for three quarters of a point, but I had like a 40-point or 50-point run in something. I forget exactly what it was, but it was something ridiculous. And I'll never forget, I was talking with somebody on the phone right around the time it happened. He's like, why are you so pissed off? I was like, oh, man, they effed me. It took, it took like three quarters of a point, blah, blah, blah. He's like, well, what'd you make? I was like, oh, I don't know, 40, 49 points. He's like... Let me get this straight. You made 49 points on a trade, and you're pissed off? He's like, if you made money on a trade, you need to be happy. And you know what? That stuck with me. I was 20-something years ago, and I've never forgotten that. So, unfortunately, this thing didn't turn out to be fantastic. I remember five years ago, my daughter was a little younger. She uh, or she was five years younger, in fact. Uh, she, you know, she came home with a project, fortunately and unfortunately. And you had to talk about things that were fortunately and then unfortunately. And then, you know, so now that's kind of like an ongoing joke with my wife and I. It's like the fortunately and unfortunately. So, yeah, unfortunately, you lose a little money. But fortunately, you made money, too. You, you lost some of that open profit. So in the end, it's going to end badly on all trades. You're going to have to give up some of those open profits. But if you're not willing to give up those open profits, you're never going to get – tremendous returns on a trade so it's okay to let things stop out by the way like i said in the youtube video i did yesterday if you haven't gotten stopped out of all of your longs yet whatever's remaining that must be some really impressive stock and i'm going to talk a little bit about inefficiency in just a minute but if you haven't gotten stopped out yet you must be in some incredible stocks we've been stopped out as i said yesterday's youtube for several months, we've been getting stopped out of trades almost systematically. It's kind of like aggravating, but hey, market begins to roll over, and it's nice being flat or mostly flat, and it's nice to keep your head while everyone else is losing theirs. Uh, don't catch falling knives. Such a horrible idea. Over the past couple of weeks, a few people have told me, hey, Dave, I bought Disney when it was on sales. Like, no, no, it's such a bad thing to do. And you might look like a genius shorter term, like, wow, look at that trade. That's pretty impressive. But longer term, it's such a bad idea. As I also said, not to beat the dead horse on the YouTube, but uh, one of my favorite quotes came from Tom McClellan when he was speaking to us down in New Orleans at the um, – New Orleans. I sound like I'm a tourist. New Orleans is how you say it down here. He was speaking in New Orleans at the uh, – or New Orleans – at the APTA conference, American Association of Professional Technical Analysts. And I know I say this almost every week, but it's such a great thing. It's like, when you buy a stock, you're forming a relationship with that company and you expect the company to do good things, but you're also forming a relationship with anyone who has purchased that stock prior to you. And he goes on to say, those people will screw you. And when I mentioned that to him, he says, well, I got a better one for my late mother, Marion. She said, and I'm gonna paraphrase best I can, she says people buy stocks when they have money or people people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. People buy stocks. Some buy stocks when they have money. Let me get it right. Some buy stocks when they have money. Some sell stocks when they need money. And some use far more sophisticated methods. And, uh, again, quoting my friend uh, Dick Fruth, I'm not name dropping. I just, it just you, 
if you're around long enough, you get to know these people and you get a lot of gems from them. And I think it's worth sharing these things. But Dick Fruits over in Houston, he's managing them. Oh, a few hundred million or so. I forget exactly how much, which is impressive because he's got a very small office. But anyway, when he first got started as a broker with most of the other brokers, if people would bring their shares in, they would grab the shares out the hand, sell them and give them a ticket and kick them out the office. Whereas Dick would sit them down they'd have a cup of coffee, he'd take the shares, he'd sell the shares and said, so why are you selling? What's going on? Oh, uh, you know, my wife's having a baby or, uh, you know, uh, I slipped and um, I stuck something where I shouldn't have, and um, now I'm getting a divorce, or we're, we're going to buy a house, or my kids are going to college. And rarely did they ever say some sort of reason like, oh, I don't like the last earning statement, or uh, this company is no longer performing as it should. So it was kind of interesting to see that kind of insight. And I think we miss all that. I think we miss that insight nowadays. So that's where somebody like an old timer like that, back when people didn't trust the brokerages and they actually had their shares in their hands and would go in and, and hand over shares. I think we're missing that point, that human interaction. Uh, so again, those people will screw you. Now think about all the funds that might, it's 5,000, if 5,000 funds, and Phil, if you're in here, if you could look it up, that'd be awesome. If 5,000 funds own Apple, how many funds do you think own Disney? Okay. You can't, nobody's going to complain when you're on Disney and Disney's way up here. And it was way down here a long time ago. Okay. That's a pretty safe bet to have that in your portfolio. So when they look at your portfolio, but then when this begins to happen, it's going to start looking ugly. Now, let's say some people who own that mutual fund that owns Disney decide, well, wait a minute. This market is tanking in here, the overall market. And this was my kid's college fund. It's like, you know, do I want to sit him? You know, he's no longer going to be able to go to Tulane or Rice or Harvard or whatever. Uh, he might end up at community college at this rate, so I better sell that mutual fund. So that mutual fund manager is going to have to raise some cash, and guess what? He's going to have to sell that Disney. And here's the other thing, too. And this is part of the go go dobo is that these stocks at higher levels can become a so-called source of funds. So... Yeah, that's great. You know, you're buying things that are on sale, but do you have a plan? Now, there are people that go out and catch the falling knife. There are people that play this mean reversion. God bless appointed little heads, okay? Um, very dangerous way to trade. And the true mean reversion, people tell you don't use stops. You just, uh, you know, you just wait for them to bounce back and then sell at a profit. Well, that's great, but that'll work until it don't, okay? So I think it's a very dangerous thing to catch these falling knives. I think that the worst thing could happen is that you become profitable, especially in your first trade. Somebody was saying, oh, I was so excited. I wanted to put my Disney years on and walk around my, my job because I bought it in 94 and a few days later it was at 100 and something. It's like, oh, man, it's just such a bad idea. And that's the worst thing that could happen to you as a – as a trader or somebody who makes a first foray into the market, foray into the markets, is that you have this instant success. Now, again, if if that's your job to catch these falling knives and you've got some kind of plan in place and you're playing these big mean reversion bounces, there's more than one way to skin a cat, okay? And if you're playing these dead cat bounces, then then God bless you. And, and as long as you have a plan in place and that's what you devoted your life to doing, then by all means do it. But don't rush in and think, oh, I'm just going to start catching things as they fall. I'm going to try to catch that so-called falling knife, right? It's just a bad idea. Okay. Number three, seek out inefficient issues such as speculative issues and lower price slash volatile issues, IPOs. So that's just a few examples of those. Uh, this is an actual IPO that's on my radar right now. And it's worked its way higher. It's accelerated higher. And it's pulled back. It's volatile. It's going to be a dangerous trade. I cautioned my clients on this one and said, you know, this is an honorable mention. This is not going to go into the official core portfolio. 
because I think it's a little too dangerous, but I think it's an honorable mention, and it might be worth a shot. Okay, it's going to be dangerous, but it might be worth a shot. Um, I have an article on, and I do have a new report out there too, but if you go to my free reports on the website, uh, which is under products or under the store, however you want to look at it, I do have an article on why you should trade inefficient stocks. So read that, and you'll you'll know a lot more about my take on inefficient stocks. But these inefficient issues right now are they're going to be lacking in fundamentals. Not that I use fundamentals, but they're going to be lacking in fundamentals. Okay, and they're just going to be trading on, like I said in the IPO course, the promise of the future. So they're going to be trading purely on emotions. So look for inefficiencies. If you're going to trade the log side, okay. Also, um, cash is not trash. That's a stupid saying. Cash is trash. There's nothing wrong with being in cash. What's ironic is the longer I am quote unquote a trader, the less trades that I make, okay. And I think that just. It just comes with the territory. You get better and better at what you do. And you realize that I don't have to be chasing my own tail every day, okay? And as a private trader, that's the great thing about being a private trader. You can do whatever the hell you want, okay? And you're not forced to buy stocks. Now, I pick on some of these money managers just ride the market down, these long only guys. But... In reality, is they're they're in a, they're in a bit of a pickle, okay. If they're only half invested, and the market turns around tomorrow and goes straight back up, they're gonna lose their job, okay. I think more of those guys lose their job because they're not in a market when the market makes a big turn back up. Then those that just ride it down because they're supposed to buy stocks. So they're just buying stocks or holding on to stocks and riding the market down. They're not, from what I understand, at least some of them, they are not penalized for buying stocks. They're penalized for being in cash, which is the craziest thing ever. Cash is not trash. It's okay to be in cash, like I've been saying quite a bit. It's better to be on a dock wishing you were out to sea than out to sea wishing you were on a dock. I have had a, I have a lot of experience with that. I We sailed through a low-pressure system once. Um, that was a pretty scary thing. We were the smallest boat in the race. Uh, in another race, we were, we were maybe on the biggest boat in the race. We were on our way to Bermuda, and I forget what trench it is or whatever. I, over there. For a second, I thought it was Mariana, but that's in another ocean that I've never sailed in. Well, I'll at least sailed across or whatever. Um, anyway, not that it matters, but we were at two miles, you know, there's 10,000 feet of water. Water's about two miles deep. Not that it really matters, with, whether it's 100 feet deep or 1,000 feet or 10,000. But anyway, we were taking our water, the boat was sinking. And, uh, <laughs> Boy, I tell you, it brings it, it. You really understand what a sinking feeling is after that. And I turned a little white, and I climbed up towards the mast, and I was ready to climb the mast like this. Uh, this poor gentleman here, <laughs> and I got to thinking, <laughs> we've got two miles of ocean below us. What's uh, climbing up a hundred feet gonna do me? You know, <laughs> I'll just be last to sink. So um, you really have to face reality there. But that's that's. It's better to be watching this market unfold. Okay and miss some of the action, so-called action, right, than it is to be losing money in the market. So there's nothing wrong with cash. Don't beat yourself up if you're in cash. And don't beat your money manager up or your advisor or the guy who's giving you some uh, trading education if he's saying, hey, let's just stay out of this market's way. And then, you know, the other analogy, what's even better, a little bit more realistic uh, for uh, some people, is that uh, pilot friends of mine, um, the old saying there is better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than in the air wishing you were on the ground. Now, let's take a look at a couple of more things in here. First of all, consider commodity-related stocks that can, this is a key word in this sentence, trade contra to the overall market, but only if they are going up. Okay. Now, we are long USO right now. 
which is the uh, ETF for oil. And the reason I like it is it made a big thrust off its lows, and it made this little knockout move or a little first little pullback. And it looked like it was going to be off to the races right here. But what has it done? Well, it hasn't done much lately, Janet. Okay, it's just kind of going sideways. But it hasn't done anything wrong, okay? Market doesn't always adhere to your time frame, as those of you who have been trading for more than 20 minutes know, okay? So, so far, oil is looking okay. I'm not saying it looks great right now, but it doesn't look bad. It looks like it's trying to bottom. The oil stocks, and if I tried to explain this pattern to you, you'd think I was crazy because it's a little esoteric, but there is a pattern, and it's kind of like a, a, a double bottom or a falling double bottom, and I've seen it quite a bit where you can just see this fast, this last little low where you make a kind of a falling double bottom. Now, keep in mind, this is a sign and not a signal. OK, so this market looks like it's losing momentum. This is the energy stocks. But I'm not going to rush out and buy it just yet. OK, so I'm going to wait for that bow tie. I'm going to wait for that big first thrust off of lows. Something that looks like this, like, hey, maybe that market's turning because these stocks are so beaten up. Not that I want to confuse the issue with facts or throw fundamentals into the mix. But this morning, my wife puts on the news in the morning. I, I avoid all news. I don't care. I don't watch it. But if it's on and I eat breakfast, I'll, I'll obviously watch it. And um, some oil company down in Fushan is laying off uh, another 100 people or another 1,000 people, whatever. And so it's like these oil companies are to a point where oil is so low, they're just, they're just, like, they're just cleaning house. Well, guess what? That's usually the end of that cycle. What you see this kind of like wholesale selling. And then um, in uh, Tom McClellan's forum, I saw yesterday or whatever, they, they were, uh, I think Walter Deemer or someone had talked about years ago that, that sometimes, especially with a commodity related stock like energies, towards the end, you get this forced selling. And I think that's, I think that's the phase we're in. Now, that's not a timing signal, okay? That's a sign. That's kind of like a get ready to get ready. The timing signal would be the setup, the bow tie, the trigger, some sort of, again, setup to go in and enter that market. Like we had in the energy stocks over, I'm sorry, in the USO, we actually had a first thrust there, okay? Now, to short or not to short, we got a ton of questions coming in, so let me let me get a few questions out, and then we'll we'll wrap that up, okay? The thing messing up is the constant huge mor uh, morning gaps, just say it. Well, yeah, uh, the volatility we the volatility has come back to this market. And, again, it's kind of like that better to be on the dock thing, better to be on the ground thing. I'm just kind of like coming in every morning, sipping my cup of coffee, like, ooh, nice little, nice little opening gap reversal, you know. Now, you can go in just for S&Gs and, and maybe – I'm not a big day trader, but every now and then you could take a, an intraday position trade and maybe trade those little opening gap reversals. But it's kind of nice to come in and sip a cup of coffee and say, oh, futures are up 20-something points. Oh, look at that. Futures are down 30-something points. Yeah, like, That's interesting, okay? That's a lot easier to like, oh, fudge sickle, you know? <laughs> futures got creamed overnight. And my wife, used, my wife always knows. When to kind of like stay away because if she ever fought because I never watched Bloomberg, I never watched CNBC or any of those channels. But like if she catches me like 11 o'clock at night putting on Bloomberg or something to see what the futures are or whatever before bed or, or watching some sort of markets overnight, she knows that that something bad is happening. So it's sure is nice, again, being on the dock, <laughs> you know, watching these things unfold when you're in the mist, mixed, mist of it, mist of it. Is that the right word? Uh, it's a little bit different. And as I, as I wrote in layman's, but the, the editor, one of the editors at least pulled it out. It's like, uh, and I thought it was a great way of saying things. It's, it's kind of like, if you can't see things clearly, pull your head out the washing machine. And I, I think that's a great way of putting it. So yeah, pull your head out the washing machine. Maybe let those stops take you out of your stocks or, or whatever market you're trading. And then you're going to be surprised how, much more clearly you will begin to see things, okay? <laughs> Number seven, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> By God's golden food, question mark. Oh, that's a question mark. I thought that was a joke. 
Uh, yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, well, yeah, the goal thing too. I, I mentioned that yesterday, and it's not. Um, it does, and I think in yesterday's, I might have missaid a word or two. I said gold would be the obvious choice, but gold is not necessarily bottomed out yet. I'd say the timing is there just yet, but if it would be great if gold would go up because gold could trade contra to the overall market. Uh, what was that song? Wasn't there a song like Bring Lawyers, Guns, and Money? Was it Eddie Money or was it uh, – who, who sang that? I seem to remember that song. Now, the question is – well, let me just see if we got uh, wipe, wipe up some more of these questions. Dave, I listened to a podcast with Jerry Parker. I'm not from – I don't know Jerry. Uh, I found it interesting that he describes risk with – when volatility increases, do you think it's a valid concept, for example, the increased volatility in the index is decreasing risk from 2% to 1% per trade? Don. Uh, no, no. I think um, I think that you have to trade at a consistent size. And it, sometimes you got to be careful not to fight the last war. The volatility has increased, but, um, you know, maybe that, maybe that bomb's already blown up. I mean, I don't know. Maybe we're due for volatility to actually decrease. I think you have to trade at a consistent size, okay? Now, if you're just getting started at trading and trading, trade at like a, a quarter percent per trade or even less. Obviously, paper trade first until you get the gist of it and then start putting real money on the line. And like I've always said, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader, provided you put your, put your time in a little bit and study the markets and have a viable methodology. But... Maybe start out trading a quarter percent, but when you trade a quarter percent, it's like quarter percent, quarter percent, quarter percent of your of your trading portfolio on every trade. Be consistent in that, okay? And then slowly work your way up to 2%. 2%, as I said last week or week before, whenever, it's a significant amount of money if things go wrong, okay? But it's still enough money if things go right. I mean, you're never long enough when things are going up, and you're never short enough when things are going down. And that's just something you have to learn to live with, and it comes with the territory, okay? Just, you know, learning to acceptance is a big thing, and maybe uh, it's – when I do these um, weekly shows, it kind of helps me be a sounding board for myself, but maybe that's the secret to trading is acceptance, okay? Accept the fact that you're not going to catch every zig and zag. Accept the fact – that you're going to have to give up some of that trend in the end, except the fact that you're going to be wrong sometimes. Warren Zevon, yeah, late 70s. That's Warren Zevon. All right, good job, guys. Hank, Paul, you know your music. Bring lawyers, guns, and money. <laughs> so I'm always going to feel bad? That's correct. Laugh out loud. Yeah, you know, I, I like what they said at Market Wizards. And God, it's so true. That book, That book was such a good book. The first one, at least. And I think the other ones are pretty good, too. So read them all. Uh, Schwager did a good job with that. He really did. But in the first one, and I forget who said it, it's like uh, three months out of the year, you're hot. You're so hot, you can't sleep at night because you're so hot. And you wonder when it's going to end. It's like when I get hot, I actually get more nervous than when, than when I'm cold. You know, because it's like, well, when I'm cold, I do have that self-doubt. I do wonder when it's going to end. But I know if I just kind of hang in there, eventually it's going to get better. But three months of the year, you're you're hot. You're so hot. You just you're like, okay, it's gonna come to the end. Nobody is this great, provided you've been doing it for a while. Because the first few times you get hot, you think you're a genius, and it goes to your head. And then three months of the year, you're cold. You're so cold. You're like, you wonder if you just go off and flip burgers, and, and if you're worthless, and if everything is just no longer works. And then the other six months of the year, you make money, lose money. You just grind it out, and you're not sleeping because you're so busy grinding it out. So he makes some really good points. In that thing. So, yeah, yeah, you're not going to be happy in this business. I'm sorry. <laughs> Greg says, Dave, I'm finding by using your strategies by sweet trading from your book, The Ted Best, I have have been working well for shorts and logs in a 30 day cycle. Can you comment on sweet trading versus long term trading? Yeah, well, before we get, I don't want to digress too far. But the real money is in longer term trends, but you can only predict the short term. And that's why if you look on the free reports right now, uh, I've elaborated on some of those things I've talked about 
ad nauseum in the books. But I think that you go in for the short term and you stick around, hopefully for a longer term trend, because that's where the real money is, is in the longer term trends. But you can only predict short term. So I kind of see it as a have your cake and eat it too. Get that little piece out and then hang on to a piece for longer term trade. Now, the thing is, how often does a longer term uh, trend ensue? Uh, I'd like to see it happen a lot more than it does. But in the right conditions, it can happen quite often. You can make a lot of money in longer term trends. But just every now and then, they just seem to come along just enough to make it all worthwhile where you do capture that one stock that goes up 100% or 200% or more. And that makes your whole year worthwhile. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with the shorter term swing trading as long as you're keeping your, or with any methodology for that matter, as long as you're keeping your risk in line and position yourself for limited risk and the potential of unlimited gains, uh, you'll do just fine. But yeah, when the volatility increases, the short-term stuff starts working sometimes a lot better. Unfortunately, that volatility can cut both ways. So you could also get whacked pretty good. So it is always still a good idea. And I know I shouldn't say in my opinion because if I'm talking, it's my opinion, right? And I'm not allowed to give the opinion of others anymore. Now I've gotten a little older, I realize that. Um, but in my opinion, uh, you, where was I going with this? You're much better off. Uh, sticking, trading for the longer term gains and sticking with positions longer term because that's where the real money is. Uh, the problem with the shorter term is is that you could do really well, but if you get whacked really hard because something bad could happen over the shorter term, you're not going to have anything to compensate for that loss. You're not going to have that big gain or that potential for that big, huge gain to make to make back all that loss and then some. Yeah, I kind of went around the block on that one. Sorry about that. I'm pretty guilty of that. Uh, short stocks or not? And that's what's fun about these forums. I don't, I don't get too excited. I try to not take them too serious, like it's a, it's a speech of my life. And it just kind of uh, somebody once told me, I was like, oh, I ramble too much. I'm like, no, 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 no. I, when you ramble, I actually learn something. I learn more than when you're trying to tell me something directly. So I just kind of let this uh, thing go wherever it wants to go. And that's why it's a lot of fun. Uh, shorts. Shorts be a real pain. You guys have seen this slide a thousand times from me. Uh, for you new guys, in an ideal world, this is what a short should look like. You just short it, and you just trail that stop down. You ride it down. It's nice and beautiful, kind of like the long side. You know, you just hey, you just get on and ride that trend. That's all you have to do. In reality, as I've drawn in with this red line here, it's like you get in, and then it's like, oh, it looks pretty good, and then all of a sudden the market shoots right back up at a retrace rally, stops you out, and then of course, what does it do? It rolls right back over. So shorts, quite frankly, are a pain in the ass. Is it worth it? I don't know. And the older I get, the more, the less I think they're worth it. Because first of all, you know, maybe probably not worth it. Uh, the only, the, the max you could ever make on a short is 100%. Now, you can, obviously, in theory, trade around a core position. So if you did, if you were fortunate enough to have one that looked like this, you could sell short, take some profits, put them back on, take some profits, put them back on uh, when it rolls back over again, and then rinse and repeat. Okay, so yeah, you could do that, and that's a wonderful thing when it works. That doesn't happen that often. So that is one obvious problem on the short side. Uh, potential unlimited losses, by the way, but you'd have to be a stupid idiot and have a lot of money to lose an unlimited amount of money, right? <laughs> Because your broker will kindly exit the shorts for you. Okay, raise your hand if you had a margin call uh, ever. Yeah, we've all had a margin call. Uh, if not, you haven't been trading enough. Um, <laughs> it happens, right? Uh, but you don't want you want to have a stop in place. You want to exit long before you get that phone call from your broker. Okay, don't answer a mar margin call. Uh, so you would have to keep putting more and more money in the account. And, and I think most people wouldn't be stupid enough to do that. But some people are, I guess. So technically, you could lose a limited amount of money. Uh, the good is they slide faster than glide. The bad is they slide faster than glide. Sometimes it's tough to get on board. Sometimes you see a market might be doing this, and all of a sudden, pfft, it does that. And by the time you recognize that it's rolled over, it's too late. And that's why I said earlier, somebody was asking me, 
hey, Dave, what about these weekly setups? And it's like, yeah, but you got to be really careful if you're trying to trade, especially shorts on a weekly, because by the time you recognize that pattern, it may already be over with. Okay. Uh, so in, during questionable conditions, it's kind of darned if you do, darned if you don't. I mean, think about the recent little slide we had. You know, say you get short, but then the market had this massive retrace rally back up. So, you know, you make a lot of money, then you lose it all back sometimes. Somebody once told me, oh, I get out of the first signs of adversity. Bullshit. Okay. Because <laughs> if that's the case, then you'd be getting out at a one tick loss or one whatever. One thing profit, it's stupid because markets have these sharp retrace rallies. There's no way you can hold on on the short side and get out, quote, unquote, the first side of adversity. Okay? That's how you – I mean, that's just a stupid statement to say. Um, the retrace rallies, again, pain in the butt. Buybacks. Uh, people get confused about buybacks. Uh, Bob buys 100 shares of a stock. You borrow Bob's shares, okay? You don't know you're borrowing from Bob, but let's just say in this particular case you do. So you got 100 bought and borrowed, and you sold them. So 100 minus 100 equals zero. Everything nets out, right? Bob sells his shares, unbeknownst to him that you have borrowed and shorted his shares. Now you have two sales. So there's 200 stocks, 200 shares of stock that have to be replaced, and only one original buy of 100. OK, so those shares have to be replaced. So they have to buy them back. So you could be short a stock and they can actually say, sorry, sorry, but those shares are no longer available. You shorted. So you have to close your position. Hopefully that makes sense. And then obviously there's logistics. You have to borrow the shares. Shorts are planting the seeds for the next bull market. That's one way of looking at it. It's, it's just it's it's a. Uh, it's just buying in the future. When you short a stock, you say, oh, I'm going to buy in the future. I just don't want to buy it right now. <laughs> so that's one way of looking at it. Uh, shorts aren't evil, okay? If you're a trader, markets go up and markets go down, quite frankly, okay? It is what it is. And the only way you're going to make money when the market's going down is to either sit in cash Nothing wrong with that. I can't beat that dead horse enough. Nothing wrong with sitting in cash. At least you'll make a, you know, point zero 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 percent on your money, one percent on your money, and then pretty soon you'll make point zero 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 one two percent on your money. Okay, when the Fed finally has to raise interest rates, we get paid to trade. That's what we do. Okay, it's like salt and pepper pushing it. That's what we do, right? This is the biggest advantage to shorting. I mean, other than you can make money on a short side, okay? But this is the biggest advantage to shorting. It forces you to see both sides of the market. You rarely will meet a bearish long only guy. The glass is always half full. There's always a reason why the market will go up, why this is just a correction, okay? But if you start shorting stocks, and shorting markets, you'll reach this point where you really will believe that markets go up and markets go down, okay? I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's just the opposite. It's not easy shorting a market. Um, obviously, it can help mitigate damages, doing serious downturns. The only game in town in bear markets, 2008, market just went down. So what do we do? Well, we shorted it, okay? We didn't get rich, but we had a positive year. Okay, wasn't by a lot. I think it was low double digits or maybe even high single digits. Wasn't fantastic. But you made money in a year where 90% of money managers lost money. So that's a that's a nice place to be. Okay. You're not going to retire <laughs> making 8% or whatever it was, 10% on your money in a year or 12, I forget. But it wasn't enough to brag about. But on a relative basis, yeah, it's pretty good. So nothing wrong with that. Um, I originally wrote this last year in 2014. Too many have become dependent on the Fed to feed the flames, and, and absolutely. All right, so that's what you're going to do uh, with the market. Uh, I'm not going to go into the, the details of this because I've got a report on that. We talked about it before, but I left the slide in here. Go in and read this free report on my website, GoGoNomo. And uh, it 
just to recap real quick, if you're going to short a stock, at least at this juncture, I prefer shorting stocks that are up here like this. Something that looks like Disney, right? As opposed to these energy stocks that are beaten up longer term. Uh, random thoughts. Don't get too caught up in a retrace rally. If you come in and futures are up a bunch of percent, you know, bear markets are ugly. Bear markets are choppy. Uh, they're tough, but don't get sucked into the, the volatility like some of you guys have already mentioned in here today. And that's where being mostly flat and, and just waiting to pick your spots carefully. The old Jimmy Rogers from Market Widgets thing that I say every week. Wait until you see that money lying in the corner and walk over and pick it up. In the meantime, quoting Rogers, do nothing. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. Do pick your spots carefully. If only there were a course on stock selection. Hmm. All kidding aside. You follow the simple things I do in the course and things that I often preach in these YouTubes and the week of charts. Trade with the trend, either an established and obvious trend or an obvious trend reversal, emerging trend, I should say, or trend transition, have you want to look at it and call it. You're going to do just fine longer term. Don't try to outsmart the market. Uh, sometimes that might mean that you're sitting around waiting. And again, I can't beat the dead horse enough about not bad sitting on the ground or sitting on the dock, right? Get your six pack of beer, sit on the dock and drink a six pack of beer. <laughs> Better than hanging your head on the side of the boat. And I've done both. Um, if this is a real deal, we'll have plenty enough time to get short. I, I know I said they slide faster than they glide. My pilot friends tell me that, that that's a bad saying, but that's an old Wall Street saying because technically a glide is this. A glide means descent, but we're talking about like a glide higher. Who, who said it the other day? Uh, bears take the uh, bulls. It, I know the escalator up and the elevator down thing, but I think the, the bears jump out the window was kind of an interesting analogy somebody added in. Uh, again, as I've been saying quite a bit, I'm getting emails on this for some reason still. I don't know why. Your better bet or your best bet at this juncture would be short stocks that are up here versus stocks that are down here looking kind of ugly longer term. This is going to have a longer way to go than this will, okay? Doesn't mean you should bottom fish and buy that, but if you're going to short a stock, short a stock that looks like this versus one that looks like that, okay? All right, lots of questions. I'm done with the slides. I just got a couple of announcements, and we're, we'll hop into the charts. All right, David says, any significance to transportation index crossing below the 200-day moving average along with the 50 and the 200 moving average leading other indices by four to five butts? Um, well, that's one of those signals, David, that only matters when it matters. And it, it's like anything, um, it matters when it matters. It's something to pay attention to. I'm not a big Dow theorist, but I'm sure that after all is said and done, and by the way, a lot more is usually said than done, uh, but after all is said and done, the Dow theorists are going to come out of the woodwork, woodwork and, and point out the, that signal. But yeah, we saw those transportations beginning to deteriorate for quite a while. Um, I think this time it worked, it worked well. I don't think it's going to work every time. Uh, but I do think that it's important to pay attention to that. Now, somebody once recently said that your semiconductors are the new transportation highway as opposed to the old form of transportation. But I think transportation is still very relevant because it's, it's like every time something goes away, something comes back. If you think about it, it's like a friend of mine runs a plant and they make um, – he's a safety guy at a plant – and they make paper. I'm like, well, you know, who uses paper anymore? It's like, well – he goes, you know, uh, <laughs> you know that stuff you buy on Amazon? I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, we make those boxes. So I was like, ah, okay. So it's like a new thing emerges. And then you got FedEx, you got UPS delivering all. So we're on this online society. So everything's different, but everything's the same, I suppose. So, yeah, do pay attention to what's going on in transportation index. But you can't necessarily use that for your timing. Like you pointed out, David, which is very astute. Is that, yeah, they, they rolled over four or five months ago, but you can't rush out and sell stocks four or five months ago when that happened because what happened? Well, the market still went higher, okay? So it's not necessarily a timing signal, 
but it's a signal, or I should say a sign, nonetheless. So do pay attention to it, but don't try to get your timing down to just that, okay? And we'll take a look at the transports in just one second. Good, uh, good point, though, David. Bear markets occur roughly every 39 months, lasting about 18 months. This is a lot of time where the odds are stacked against longs. Yeah, great point, Howard. Uh, beautiful point, okay? <laughs> or, as I like to say, markets go up and markets go down. And, by the way, and I actually learned this from, from Greg Morris. Again, you get a lot of good stuff from these old timers. And uh, he said that the the buy and hold argument is based on an 81-year time horizon. 81-year, yeah, 81-year time horizon. So who has 81 years to invest, okay? <laughs> I guess if you had 81 years, you know, you wake up, uh, you, you're born, and, um, you know, you start investing. And when you're 81 years old, you'd probably be okay, okay? <laughs> so, you know, who has that long time? And like I showed in, in layman's, it was like, and I've been laughed. I've been laughed in the face before. I've been in cocktail. I used to get in arguments in cocktail parties. I don't do it anymore. I just, I just enjoy free drinks now. But you know, the people start saying the market will always come back. I'm like, you know, that's nice. You know, <laughs> which is southern for uh, you idiot. But <laughs> it doesn't always come back. And sometimes it might take 25 years or more to come back. If you don't believe me. Whip out your copy of Layman's. I've got some charts in there showing you just that. All right, a couple of real announcements real quick, and I'll, you know, I'll get to those um, remaining questions, promise. Uh, again, i got a new report available uh, now on the website. It's a trader's article. It uh, just came out in Trader's Magazine. Uh, just, I thought it would be kind of cool. I, I was on a website the other day. It had like new, new, not new improved, but new this week or something, and it was a sales website, but I thought it was kind of cool. It was a... Um, but I thought it was kind of cool, be cool to add that to my website because somebody told me a while back, you've got a lot of good information, but you seem to hide it. So uh, I put that on my website, so check that out. Uh, for those of you who are looking for some action outside of the market, which right now, eh, it's probably not a bad time to do that. Uh, Vegas is just around the corner. I'm going to be at uh, Traders Expo a couple of weeks, so check that out. About the same age as Warren Buffett. Uh, who's about the same age as Warren Buffett? Could a double bottom might be setting up at 1850? In your opinion, would that negate the bow tie down? No. Okay. Um, with any type of transitional pattern, a double bottom, a bow tie, a first thrust, or any other type, a head and shoulders bottom, or a cup and handle, you know, name your favorite bottom pattern. Or do as I do, use most of those all together. When a market that a bottoming pattern is best at a bottom, okay, 2008, okay, market does this, and then you had that big spike V bottom, okay, that's more exciting than something that happens up here, okay, because the market is in a longer term trend, and most people are the wrong side of the market when you have this transition after a long, long, long term downtrend. That's why I'm more excited about the energies right now as a possible buy than it would be the biotechs, okay? Now, let me just show you that what that looks like on a chart. So we've got the S&P. In fact, let's go back to the S&P. we got it in here somewhere. Good question, though. I like the question. So where's the peas? Okay. So you're saying that this could be a possible double bottom. It might be, okay? But the market, and you really can't see it in this particular chart, so let's go to this particular this chart here. And I don't know if you're looking back to, to here or here or the recent double bottom we just looked at, possible double bottom. I'm more excited about some sort of transitional pattern after something like this than I am after something like this, okay? To me, this looks like an early phase, the early phases of a rollover. In fact, it actually kind of looks like a cup and handle, doesn't it? It's a bow tie, it's a cup and handle, and it's a few other things. So I wouldn't be too excited about a bottoming signal here. Believe it or not, and I talked about this a few weeks ago, and some people gasped. 
But this market would actually have to make it all the way back to new highs for me to even think about it. I don't think it's a good idea to try to catch transitions back up after a market has begun to roll over. Okay, I think it's a good idea to look for transitions like in 2009 and in the energies right now, in the gold stocks right now. Don't rush out and buy them today. Okay. But Dave, you said you would look for transitions. Well, not, not yet. Okay. But we're getting there. We're getting there. Just be patient. So I wouldn't trade some sort of transition pattern back up at these high levels. But a year from now or two years from now, we're down towards six, seven hundred in the markets. Then, yeah, by all means, start looking for those transitional patterns. Okay. If we start hitting five and 10 year lows, yeah, look for those transitional patterns back up. But you don't want to look for a bow tie up at this juncture. If anything, let the market get back to the old highs. Let everybody else fight it out. As I've said, a nausea, you got all its overhead supply to overcome. It doesn't look like a whole lot on a weekly, but uh, if you look at a daily chart, it's it's very significant. Okay. You were talking about, oh, you talk about the A2 Euro horizon. Yeah. Yeah. So Warren Buffett, he's, he's done fine. Okay. <laughs> Hadi in Honduras. I'm desperate, man. Send lawyers, guns, and money. This shit has hit the fan. <laughs> oh, is that is that part of the song? Hey, Dave, the bear you might get, market might be Nadir, similar to Baron's cover. Oh, okay. Well, if the bear's on the cover of Baron's, then maybe this thing is over. Stage three distribution. Oh, it's in the song. Cool. MO. Okay. All right. Let me get into the charts. Greg Morris has three books on candles. Yes, he does. In fact, Greg actually went to Japan and studied candles, I think, before Nissan did. I know, um, I know that he went to Japan and to learn about how to trade candles. So he learned straight from Japanese. But even Greg will tell you, when people talk about reversal patterns, it's like, well, what are you reversing? Okay. If you got a long, long uptrend, and then maybe you get a baby with a poopy diaper or whatever the 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 signal is, then maybe that might be the end of that trend. Okay, but here's the deal: there's also Western patterns that will show the same exact thing too. So yeah, I'm I'm friends with Greg, and and I know he's got some books on candles out there. Doesn't mean that I'm against candles. I'm just against the implementation of the way many people implement them. Okay. Buy and hold. <laughs> Do you bring the guns to shoot the lawyers? <laughs> All right, let's hop into the charts. I think uh, I did my announcements. Yeah, let's just hop into the charts. All right. I've kind of beat the dead horse on most of this stuff already, so there's no need to spend a whole lot of time in it. So you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, please do so now. The only the only thing I ask is that just ask about a stock and then hit return and then ask about another one if you want to ask about more than one. And that way I could delete the ones I go through. Uh, Bob, you're up next. We'll come to you. Okay. Obviously, market uh, not looking so hot in here still. And here's the thing, okay, yesterday went up 2%, and look, we've already given up nearly 1% of that. So let's not get too excited just yet. Keep your eye on the ball, okay? Until we get through this overhead supply, I would not be buying this market. And as I preach ad nauseum, you can't catch every zig and zag. So what if you miss 1,900 to 2,000 and change, or even 2,100? So what if you miss that move up? So what? Who cares? Okay. It's better to be on the dock <laughs> again. But so what if you miss that move? And the the risk versus reward is just not good in that. And take a look at the Nasdaq. You know, we rallied up two percent change yesterday. We're giving up over half of that. We've given up all of our intraday gains, and then now we're starting to give up some of that gap that we had. So that doesn't look too good. Take a look at the rusty. If I can find it. Sometimes it's easy to just punch it in. Okay, obviously big blue arrow still pointing down there. And look at look at today, outside date down. We've already given up all of yesterday's gains. We're approaching multi-year lows, I think, in the Rusty. Or No, not quite. We're getting there. Okay, we're getting there. We're almost to multi-year lows in the Rusty. 
It's not very pretty. Now, this whole market is oversold, okay? Doesn't mean it can't go lower. Oversold often becomes more oversold. But right now, because we're oversold, we could see the mother of all bounces in here. Don't get sucked into it, okay? And, you know, if you do get sucked into it and you make some money, well, good for you. But I, I, I'm not sure you did the right thing if that happens, okay? So don't email me and say, hey, Dave, I caught the bottom. It's like, eh, I could care less. You know, that'll work until it don't. What percentage of one stock's trading bankroll would you recommend for the use of purchase of stock uh, of your trading service? Well, what I would start by doing is I would start by, by put, you, put yourself together a model account uh, uh, of, of what you're going to trade with the service. And and then, uh, by the way, it's for educational purposes only. So, you know, that's uh, that's that's the official answer. <laughs> um, and then work with that and see how you do over time. Uh, I, I I can't guarantee you're going to do well over time, but over time, things usually work out because eventually you do catch the trends and things generally work out. OK, so but I can't there's no guarantees in this business. And of course, it's for educational purposes only. I'm no longer registered as anything. I was registered as a commodity trade advisor for about 14 years. So whatever I said then, at least versus com basis commodities can be construed as direct advice. So now everything is just educational purposes only. But I would start small. If you were trading anyone's methodology, just to keep me out of uh, keep the lawyers away, guns and money. <laughs> um, I would start with a with a a relatively small account. I mean, if you've, you've got it, if if you're talking, if you have seven figures, then start with a, a smaller six figure account, just to get a feel for things, and maybe even just watch things for a while. I know the times click it, tick it because you're paying money, but that money is going to be very significant longer term, okay, as opposed to the the potential to be there. And if you it, it, both sides of coins. I mean, if you rush it and you go um, balls to the wall, which is an old steam engine analogy, by the way, it's not anything dirty. But if you go balls to the wall straight in and then we hit a choppy period and, and you lose a lot, then you're like, whoa, this sucks. And you back off and then all of a sudden, bam, we hit a trending period. And then you make a lot, but you make a lot on a little bit of money. So net net, you end up losing. So again, you want to be consistent, but start small and build. And I know the clock's ticket or whatever, but you know, talk to me if you want to go long, long term, and I'll make you a really good deal to where it, it, it's 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 almost insignificant based on uh, the account. But uh, thanks for that question. All right, I'm not going to beat the dead horse too much in the markets. Obviously, still look like they're in trouble. Energies have bounced a little bit in here. I think this is a day o chart, so I'm not sure where they are today. Uh, USO obviously higher so far. Still looks like a bottom here is in place. Oh, except for uh, opening gap reversal. Looks like it looks like it dropped during the show. But again, it still looks pretty good in here uh, so far. Let's take a look at gold. A lot of questions on gold. Gold just can't seem to get out of its way, but it does look like it's beaten up longer term, and it could be putting in the bottom. But it's all over the place so far. So don't rush out and buy gold. I think I, I might have misworded some words in my presentation yesterday. I said gold would be the obvious choice, but then I went on to say that it wasn't set up or you shouldn't rush out and actually buy it just yet. So only buy commodities if they're going up during a questionable market. I guess I can't say bear market. People get all excited. China shenanigans are not over yet. Frenchie says that. Frenchie, I agree with you. Um, you know, we all knew that China was uh, FOS, but it's it things only matter when they matter when it comes to the markets. Uh, bears open high, close low today. Open near highs, near lows. Today's close. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but in a bear market, stocks start strong and finish weak, kind of like today. And in a bull market, stocks start weak and finish strong as a general statement. But yeah, I would err on the side. I would err on the downside if I was doing anything in this particular market. So commodities, commodities don't go up, don't buy them. Beautiful. 
so finally I reached someone. <laughs> I'm joking. I know you guys here know what's going on. But yeah, beautiful. All right, Bob says MD for some uh, for some put if breaks deck line. All right, let's take a look at that. Um, I'm not. I'm a huge fan of technical analysis, but I'm not a huge fan of of buying a or selling a stock if it's um, off a classical technical analysis pattern until or unless I have a setup. Okay. So I'm not sure what your neckline is in here. Is this like a big picture neckline like this? And your head and shoulder is here and here and here. Or you look at the double top. Um, but this stock does look like it's in trouble. Okay. And then let's put in a bow tie. And you can see that it made an all-time high here or close close enough to an all-time high. And now it's begun to roll over. So, yes, on a bounce, I think this could be a very viable candidate. But I wouldn't buy it on a breakdown, per se. I would wait for a setup. And so on that. Hey, Carol, how you doing? Good to see you. If you wanted to short the S&P, what would be your current trigger? Okay. Well, this is where it gets tricky, okay, because it's not really uh, – it's no longer set up on a daily chart. So let's maybe take a look at a weekly chart. Um, it's already triggered on a weekly chart too. Uh, it's tough. I, I don't really have a good trigger in mind, but if you did short it, uh, be prepared for the mother of all retrace rallies. I would say your stop would be have to be way up here in this range, okay? And, I mean, on an intraday basis, these opening gap reversals or – or can be a gift, but that's just S and G type of trades. Uh, it's tough to trade an index because they tend to chop around a lot, and obviously you don't have that inefficiency that you have in the individual issues. Uh, so I don't really have a particular trigger in mind, but as a general statement, it looks like I'd I'd want to be short this market more than long. Obviously at this juncture, Mr. Reese wants to know about ULBI, ULBI, ULBI. Um, I was going to say I don't know this stock, and the reason I don't know it is it's super duper thin, 30,000 shares on average. Um, if you go in and trade 1,000 shares, you're what, 3% uh, of the float, if I did my math correctly. Um, it's kind of all over the place. I mean, it's too thin to even really even talk about, but uh, just from a chart standpoint, it's all over the place. Yes, it's recently taken off uh, on a pullback, maybe. Remember that we're trend traders, but we trade pullbacks mostly. So if it pulls back maybe to five and change, it might be worth a shot. But, again, it's too thin to trade. Be careful with that. You can get in a lot of trouble with those thin stocks. With IPOs, sometimes they make a bit of a decision. From a trend's perspective, S Dow short ETF, ETF, your thoughts. Okay, I'm going to get my standard short ETF speech or I should say inverse ETF speech all ETFs have tracking errors tracking errors are exacerbated in leveraged ETFs okay and tracking errors are exacerbated in inverse ETFs and it has something to do with the fact that they track the day-over-day -day change, and that's all they're trying to adhere to. They're not trying to, with an inverse ETF, they're not saying that, okay, market goes down 10% in a month. We're going to go up 10% in a month. If you read their perspectives, perspective, what they're doing is they're trying to track the day-over-day -day change. And... There's little, and it has something to do with the way the, the, the drawdown curve works geometrically. Because if the market goes, let's say you're long, and the market goes down 1%, then back up 1%, well, it's not actually back to 100%. It's a little bit less than 1%. So those tracking errors tend to get, again, exacerbated. Day after day after day after day after day. And the more leverage and then especially like an inverse ETF, they're going to get even worse. So I would avoid inverse ETFs. You're going to find that a lot of times you can get a lot of trouble with inverse ETFs. Let's just for S&G see something here. 
All right, so if we go, this thing is up 2% since August 21st. Let's take a look at where the Dow is. August 1st, right? Let's see where August 1st is. August 1st. Beautiful, beautiful. August, I don't have the first in here. All right, let's say 731. Okay, Dow's down 8%. I've got to go one more day, sorry. 9% since 731. Let's go back to that S Dow. And let's go to, what was it 731 I said? Well, maybe a bad example. All right, that's a bad example. Scratch that. <laughs> what day is this here? How did I screw that up so bad? 21st, August 21st. Talk amongst yourselves. All right, that was a bad example. August 21st. Why can't I get the 21st in here? What am I doing wrong? Okay. Market's down 5%. Why am I screwing up so bad? What am I doing wrong? 20th. And this thing is, is up 2%. All right, so the market went down 5 or 6%, and this thing went up 2%. And this is supposed to be a leveraged fund. So you should be up 12% in this fund, if I got my math right, finally my dates right. You should be up 12% and you're up 2%. Okay, does that, I think that's a good illustration. I know I, I kind of botched it up a little bit, but that just shows you how incredible that tracking error is. In a little bit over a month, it's off by a huge percentage. Okay, so you would have made 2% in this thing and an outright short would have made 6%. Does that, and then this is leverage, so you should have made 12%. Does that, can you see it? <laughs> so uh, avoid these things like the plague. Very, very dangerous to trade. A day trade, and yeah, knock yourself out. You know, if they gap, crazy, market gaps crazy high, and you come in, you know, that's fine. But here's the thing. Because it's leveraged, your stop needs to be whatever the leverage is away. Let's say you're trading a three-time leverage fund. Well, your stop needs to be three times further away. So it all washes out, provided, of course, you're using some sort of sound money management plan. If you're not using a money management plan, you're just throwing caution to the wind, then knock yourself out. Have a good time. Hi, Dave. What do you think about Hawk for a long? Okay. H A W K. Uh, I don't like it because I don't like this big day down here. So now it's kind of like all over the place. Uh, is it up? Is it down? I'm not sure. It's kind of all over the place. In a case like this, once it starts behaving like electrocardiogram, the stock would actually have to make new highs for me to get excited about it. I mean, this is a this isn't a great example because it's kind of a little bit thinner IPO, but. Going back to our slides, remember we talked about this chart here. I mean, this is what this is the kind of stocks we're looking for to buy. Okay, you want something that's had a nice little run up in here and a nice little pullback. That is what a chart should look like. Not that you want to buy this particular stock if you figure out what it is, but that's what we're looking for in the markets. Okay, as opposed to something that's kind of all over the place like this. So I'd avoid that. Again, it's okay to sit on your hands. Okay. All right, Isaac said, gotcha. I'm like, enough with the talk about the inverse ETFs. <laughs> Sorry about that. SLP for Mr. Howard. SLP. Yeah, there you go. Unfortunately, it's super duper thin, okay? A little too thin, but that's that's what you want to look for in a long, a stock that looks like it's going up, okay? So you can draw an hour. Now, it's not set up at this juncture. And again, caveat is it's too thin to trade. 50,000 shares, that's a little too thin to trade. I mean, you don't want to, you train a thousand shares. What are you, uh, 4% of the float on that for the day or whatever? Not the float, but you know what I'm saying? The volume. So yeah, on a pullback, maybe as a private trader, you could take that, but boy, it's, that's really thin. DY for long. 
we're almost out of time. So any anyone else wants to chime in with a, with the setup, let me know. I think everybody got impatient waiting for me to get through. <laughs> Put my filibuster this week. Uh, this has a lot of support right below the market, but I hear you, and I and I kind of like where you're going with that. Uh, it looks like it's had a lot of trouble. We did have this big gap way back here, but that was a ways back. Um, I wouldn't rush out and short it just yet, but I think it's a developing situation, and I think you're definitely on to something. I think these uh, these brick and mortar companies, and this literally might be a brick and mortar company, <laughs> or um, a good place to look for opportunities right now, I think. Okay, so when someone tells me they're 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 buying Disney, it's like, well, God bless you, but I don't know about that. I, I, you know, read the Go Go No Mo uh, report, and I think that's that's where that's the type of stocks you want to be considering. Okay, any more? We're like nearly out of time. Okay, well, I, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Uh, I have a blast doing these shows, as you can tell. And I learn a lot in the process, too. So from a selfish standpoint, I get a lot out of them, and I appreciate it. Uh, you guys showing up. I'm humbled by your presence. And girls, too. We had a few girls this week, as usual. So thank you, girls, for showing up, too. I appreciate that. Uh, if we don't talk... Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, Bob. You're welcome, Craig. Um, <laughs> if we don't talk... Uh, between now and uh, then. Everybody have a fantastic weekend, and I hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.